It was not a very fun night if you wore purple or if you just punish yourself by staying up so late to watch this game because K-State got beat down in a bad, bad way, 38-9. to And Chris Kleiman was up front about it after the game. He said, we have not gotten embarrassed like this or beaten this bad outside of the COVID year, which we all understand and, like, the, the Iowa State and Texas game that COVID year, um, there's a lot going into that. Tonight, you had basically your full roster. You have a quarterback that everybody thinks is going to lead this school and this team to big things. You have a lot of things in place that you think should be the right formula. And tonight in Provo, Utah, it was not. 38-9, to BYU houses number 13, K-State. And it's interesting because K-State's defense got off to a good start like you know, you kind of would have wanted. They were able to stop BYU, lock them down. The offense moved the ball down the field and scored on their first two drives, but they had to settle for field goals, and then it snowballed from there after BYU kicked a field goal to make it 6-3. to three. K-State gets the ball back, and D.J. Giddens just out of nowhere, fumble, ball pops out. BYU takes it back for a touchdown. That would not be the last time that they took a ball back for a touchdown on a non-offensive play. Then they come out, so K-State is there, and immediately just kind of seems like they're pressing. It leads to an interception from Avery Johnson, his first of the night. Short field, BYU scores easily, and then there you sit at halftime down 17-6, to and immediately K-State came out, and the, the interception, the second one that Avery Johnson threw, to me came across as a, a young guy trying to make a play, probably not – aware enough that he shouldn't have made that throw and it led to BYU jumping up to a lead that ultimately K-State was not going to be able to catch. Bad night all around. Where is the number one story though coming from this loss? Uh, just shooting yourself in the foot really. That's where I would come out out of that. Uh, first two drives you get field goals instead of touchdowns I think because of a combination of some <laughs> excuse me interesting play calls and penalties. Penalties were a killer all night, especially in those two drives that kind of culminated in field goals rather than touchdowns. When I say play calls, it's generally just you had that third and nine, and Connor Riley elected to run the ball, so you go field goal there. And then the next drive, you have a second and five and third and five. Well, thinking maybe run the ball again. You're averaging over seven yards per carry, and then they throw on those, and it doesn't work out, and you have to kick a field goal. Then you get to the end of the half, and that's when you start shooting yourself in the foot with uh, you know, the fumble and, and everything else that kind of went into that. just It was a brutal stretch there. BYU only scored 38 points. I say only 38 points because they scored 31 of those 38 points in under six minutes. Yeah. It literally happened that fast. So that was problematic until they – and really, I don't put a ton on the defense. Yeah, you want to get – you want to hold them to field goals – uh, even on those short fields, and they weren't able to. But really, the only time the dam like broke completely for the defense in terms of just not getting the job done was the the touchdown run by Sione Moa when he breaks five tackles and scores the puts and gives them 38 points, uh, their last score of the night. So you, that's a true offensive score, I think, uh, possession. But other than that, the other four touchdowns were because Kansas State screwed up. I almost said effed up. I'm glad I didn't. Uh, Actually, it might have been valid and, and worthy tonight, but yeah, we'll keep it uh, family friendly here, you know, because I know that there are some pretty fired up 12 year olds out there watching this. Yeah, we have a, you had a scoop and score. That's one of the five touchdowns. You had the punt return. That's two of the five touchdowns. And really, you have to make a tackle there at some point. I get it, but that's also a dand if you do, dand if you don't, because they were going for the fumble, so everyone was out of position. So it's almost a little bit of bad luck there. One Avery touchdown, short field touchdown, or Avery interception. Gets a short field for a BYU touchdown. The other Avery Johnson interception, short field, BYU gets a touchdown. So just everything that BYU got outside of maybe 10 points was given to them by Kansas State. Yeah, the, there's nothing good to say about the K-State offense tonight. Nobody played well. Wide receivers, non-existent once again. Jace Brown, really the only one right now that you, you probably have full confidence in. Yeah. And Keegan Johnson was good early had some had some opportunities there, but nobody else stepping up. It's non-existent downfield. And after the game, Avery Johnson made a comment about the him and the receivers just not being on the same page tonight. So I asked him, I said, 
Is there any point through the first four games of the season where you feel like you guys have been on that same page? And I found his answer to be kind of odd because I thought he might go and point, you know, well, you know, game one or something, or we found our rhythm against Tulane, or even, you know, last week in, a, you know, an easy win against Arizona. And his answer, he just immediately went to when K-State was in garbage time tonight and said, well, you know, we got a little something going there. That was BYU just playing soft and, and not really worrying too much. So there's a pretty heavy amount of concern there. And really – all the problems tonight start with Connor Riley because he is the offensive coordinator, so he has to take the blame for what I would call disjointed play calling. Uh, his feel of the game just still is not totally there. And, and that isn't to say that he's not going to get that fixed. He can dial up some really good things. He's done some really good things as K-State's offensive coordinator this year. It's just he's still trying to find his way to getting that feel. And I think for a guy that's been an offensive line coach that's getting his first crack as an OC, that's going to take some time. It's going to be up to Chris Kleiman and K-State to decide if they actually have that time to be able to give it because when you get a loss game one of Big 12 play, it shrinks the rest of the season. I mean, K-State bought themselves time if you think back to 2022 they started that season off pretty strong because they wanted Oklahoma they beat Texas Tech like they shrunk that season down to where it was like a seven game sprint for them right now you got eight games in front of you still to go and it's gonna have to come up another note on Connor Riley where this game falls on his feet his offensive line made unforgivable mistakes once again we talked about they kind of came up here and there throughout the first couple of games tonight the holds, the pre-snap penalties, they were killers at significant times in this game. And that's just another one of those areas where K-State shot themselves in the foot and really never gave themselves a chance to kind of corral this mess that was unfolding in front of them. If you're a Kansas State coach or a player or close to a coach or player, you're probably not going to want to hear the rest of this segment because, I mean, or any of this segment because it's going to be pretty brutal. But I'll just go through it like this. Avery Johnson... His decision-making leaves a lot to be desired still. You could tell the game's a little fast for him, and I think it especially was tonight in this loud environment, which, which is, I, to be honest, I've been to a lot of road games. Uh, what they just put on tonight was top tier, yeah. one of the best ones. Uh, yeah, we well, let's real quick just throw this out there. First trip to BYU, number one. Hats off to Brett Yormark. BYU was a phenomenal addition to the Big 12 because they fit, they care, the people were great. It, it was a great environment without it being a nasty environment, which is, you know, not, that could not be said for like Tulane or some of the other places. But great environment, stadium was rocking, awesome setting. Like BYU is perfect for the Big 12. This is a great spot. Everything that happened here at BYU tonight, outside of what took place on the field, Hats off to the Cougars. And, and I think the offense felt that, and I think Avery felt that, and I thought we were some communication errors because of that. He makes probably too many wrong decisions in games still, and it takes really good teams playing at, a really, really good team to make him pay for it because he's so fast, or a team just playing out of their mind because he's so fast, and IPO he played out of their mind, so they kind of they made it hurt for him. And – his passing, I wouldn't say leaves a lot to be desired. He, he's putting good velocity on the ball. He's slinging it. It's not like the kid can't throw it, but the ball placement is leaving a lot to be desired in certain situations thus far. So he can be special, but he's, at least from a passing component, not quite as close as probably everyone expects him to be right now. I think that would be the great way to put it. I thought DJ Giddens was good, especially early. I thought Dylan Edwards was good, especially early. But when you get down a lot, then you have to kind of abandon the running game. And that was unfortunate because Kansas State was running the crap out of the ball. And, and I mean, they didn't fully abandon it, and DJ Giddens ripped off a big one. It got called back because of a penalty. So, yeah. And then getting to the offensive line, they were bad. The penalties were unforgivable. A lot of it because of this crowd. But you got to grow up and get it done. They didn't. What I was worried about going in and why I said this game is losable for Kansas State and why a lot of people push back on it, you have a quarterback in just this four-star in an environment that is really top-notch. And the center is in his first road game of this kind of environment. That exchange, that's a lot. That puts on the offensive line. 
the, the penalties were really bad, and it wasn't just the center either. You had some guys that have played a lot of college football get penalties tonight that just can't happen. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Especially the ones that killed drives. Um, and then pass protection. Um, Avery was, you know, in Avery's defense, he was running for his life quite a bit tonight. So that, that goes into it. Tight ends. Yeah, they're kind of coming alive in the passing game a bit. Um, they had four touchdown catches in the passing game going into tonight, but they're not blocking, and that, that's a problem. These tight ends have to start blocking or things aren't going to get better. Receivers, I was staying up for them a little bit through the first few weeks, at least a handful of them, because I thought they were playing better than their stats indicate. Keegan Johnson got off to a good start. Jace Brown did some things late, but again, that was against soft coverage. I know Jaden Jackson probably had the inside leverage on a deep ball late that Avery didn't get to him. I think he missed because he threw a ball late to Jace Brown. If he gets him to a little early, it might be a touchdown. That's more the Avery Johnson like decisions, timing, just not being there. But the receivers, you know, if if I want to be a real prick, and I guess I will be, I thought they I thought they took a step back tonight. Yeah, which is not good because it's not like they were too many steps ahead. There's a time for optimism, and there's certainly a way to paint that picture. People should not melt down over the season because of this loss. You can melt down about tonight. There are flaws. There are problems that need to be fixed. But it doesn't mean that there has to be problems long-term because people thought there were long-term problems after they lost to Tulane in 2022. Believe it or not, they got it figured out. This team is good enough they will get it figured out. Tonight it snowballed. Tomorrow, next week they get back to a familiar uh, territory at home and, and they get Oklahoma State. What I will say is as bad as tonight feels when you're watching this either tonight or you know Sunday morning, it's going to suck. I'm not going to lie. They played really bad. They shot their foot off. <laughs> they had, didn't deserve to win. They, they didn't get close to winning. But at the same time, it wasn't necessarily a loss that was replicable. Yeah. Like, Kansas State's not going to give an offense, the other team, four touchdowns. Like, there was two non-offensive touchdowns and two short fields. So, I just – I don't think that's something that's going to last. Yep. It's – in some ways, losses like this, I, you'd rather have that over something else and other things. It's so bad that it seems like an outlier. K-State has to prove that, though, starting next week at home against Oklahoma State. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. If you want more on the Cats and the catastrophe in Provo tonight, head over to KSO with On3. We'll get you covered there. Also, plenty of other coverage. Watch the press conferences over on the KSO YouTube right here, too.